Hi, I'm Neil Pattis and welcome to this special early edition of the Sky News Daily, where of course we're going to be focusing on that plane crash said, said to involve uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group that advanced on Moscow recently in what even Vladimir Putin himself was calling an act of treason. Now, now, first things first, this will not be a potted history nor a biography of Prigozhin. For that, you can take a look at a couple of previous episodes of The Daily that I have linked to in my socials. Instead, we will be looking at what we know and what we don't know with our, our military analyst, uh, Sean Bell. And Sean, this is a moving story. There is plenty uh, that may well emerge. We're recording this on on Thursday morning. But, but as things stand, there has been a plane crash. What do we know? We know that an aircraft came down. We understand it was his private aircraft. Um, and what's very helpful at the moment is we've seen a couple of bits of video footage on mm. it, which allows us to do a bit more close analysis of what's happened. The, um, the wreckage on the ground, it's clearly not a survivable accident in any way. And um, from my experience of uh, air crashes, largely fast jet crashes, there's not normally much left of the bodies afterwards either, which is a bit um, sombering, but it does explain why it's sometimes quite difficult to work out who has been left behind and who was on that flight. It, tell us about the video, because that, that that which I have seen shows an aircraft in, in flames plummeting quickly and, and taken together with the, with the radar information that we have, which shows the plane descending rapidly. Everything looked fine, then, then descending rapidly. What can we interpret from that? Well, first of all, aircraft crashes, unfortunately, are not uncommon. But when most of the crashes are in controlled flight, in other words, the aircraft is flying um, and it's normally a pilot error of some form or it runs out of fuel. But you can still see the aircraft in some sort of control. Um, what's evident from the footage we've seen is that that aircraft was completely out of control and it was falling like a leaf through the sky. Now, an aircraft doesn't go from flying to falling like a leaf without something pretty catastrophic happening. Um, one bit of the footage, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to study it by zooming in yet appears to show one of the wings missing um, when it gets quite close to the ground. Um, now, when you look at the start of the video footage as well, there's a little twirl of white cloud, which looks might look like a bit of cloud, but to a seasoned veteran of when we used to look out for surface-to-air missiles being fired at us, that twirl is very reminiscent of the trail of a surface-to-air missile. Now, if you join those dots up together, that aircraft either had some sort of explosion inside which took out a large part of the aircraft and rendered it instantly unflyable and just falling to the ground out of control, or it was targeted by some sort of either surface-to-air missile system or air-to-air missile system that deliberately took it out of the sky. This was a fair weather, so the video shows it was blue skies. Yes, there was some cloud around. There was no other reason why that aircraft should suddenly fall out of the skies, and I'm not a believer in coincidences. The very fact that it is Yevgeny Prigozhin's aircraft and it suffered a catastrophic failure, there is clearly something gone on that's led to the, the um, catastrophic failure of that aircraft. Uh, historically, have there been problems with this? This type of aircraft? Not to my knowledge. And, and to be brutally honest, there's lots of conjecture around. Um, I saw something on social media talking about a lot of the Russians, because of the sanctions, haven't got spare supplies for aircraft. But the, the worst that happens there is largely you, don't, you can't change the brake pads when you need to, or you fly with a couple of minor faults on the airplane. It doesn't mean you haven't uh, got structural integrity of the aircraft. Nobody, no pilot in his right mind would ever fly with an aircraft that hasn't got structural integrity. So there's no question that the professional crew that were in there, yes, they might have been carrying a couple of minor faults, but nothing that would lead to this sort of damage. And, and when we look at the manifest yeah. and we look at those who were on board, of course, it wasn't just Yevgeny Prigozhin that was, you know, the head of the, the Wagner group, but, but also I believe it was his number two as well that was on board. Yeah, Dmitry Yutkin was apparently on board as well. But again, I'm, I, there's always a heavy caveat with this because everything I hear that's come out of Russia, I always have to start with a healthy dose of salt because you're not quite sure what the truth is. Now, it, it, it's possible this has all been engineered by Yevgeny Prigozhin and he'll appear somewhere in the Bahamas in a week in one of his famous disguises uh, living out his life out there. The fact is it looks really unlikely that that's the case. It looks very likely that President Putin, the real question for me was, because this wasn't a great surprise, was it, Neil? You and I have been talking yeah. about this. Um, the question was how it took two months after the abortive coup, over, over two months before this happened. And I think actually you can read into that. Part of that was almost certainly Putin would have wanted 
to deal with him straight away. But actually, he couldn't make a martyr out of Prigozhin. And in the last 10 weeks, we've seen him gradually undermine Wagner. And I think that's why now has been the time. What about the two sides of the coin? We, we haven't yet heard from the Kremlin. That which I've heard from Wagner appears to be through kind of Wagner affiliates saying things like, well, the, the, this has been carried out by traitors to Russia. Can, can we read anything into the silence from the Kremlin as, as of the time of recording? I very much doubt it. I, I, if um, Putin has got a track record of when these things happen, whether it's poisonings, whether it's people falling out of buildings in suspicious circumstances, you know, Putin doesn't provide a narrative or, about it. Um, and But this is one of those which it, it might not be Putin. It might not have been directly ordered by Putin. But, you know, you join the dots here. Um, you know, th this was a man who betrayed Putin, who was a friend of Putin. They made their fortunes together, uh, but then ended up marching on Moscow. Um, that, that That is not something that's going to be forgiven. And as I say, the only surprise is why it's taken this long. W one thing that seems to me to have changed, the, an armed insurrection in which Russian military people, uh, military figures were killed, were air aircraft w w were brought down. Since that point, Vladimir Putin has been out and about a lot more. He has, up until this point, been kind of hiding away in the Kremlin. And even last night, whilst this news was emerging in Russia, pictures emerge on state news of him out, glad-handing, being the man of the people once again. If we look at this from a grand strategic perspective, things are not going well for President Putin. I mean, you only have to look earlier this week, the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, the, the conference there. The only person who didn't turn up was... President Putin appeared on a video conference. This week has also seen him try to land a, a, a module on the moon, failed, but India was there mm -hmm. succeeding. There are so many elements. The Russian economy is on its back foot. The um, the only military successes that Russia's had on the battlefield recently have been at Bakhmut, and that has been driven by the Wagner forces. The empire around President Putin is crumbling. The only way, the only thing he can demonstrate to demonstrate that he's not locked away is to actually get out there. And But uh, I've, I heard a couple of independent uh, voices say that they watched him live at his event the other day and he looked tired, he looked fraught, he looked nervous. That is not the characteristics of the leader who's confident in his position. And there's a lot of uh, experts around the Russian, I'm not an expert in Russian politics, but say that um, his position is looking increasingly increasingly difficult and the uh, tenure of, uh, of, of autocrats like Putin don't generally end well. Which, which leads me on to ask, I mean, has the Wagner group been, in, been entirely defenestrated then? Do they still pose a risk to him? Because presumably there are Prigozhin loyalists out there who are very, very unhappy this morning. There will be, but um, bluntly, what I think Putin has very cleverly done is two two strands to Wagner, one of which was the um, Yevgeny Prigozhin's business enterprises, and they've gradually been either sold off or removed from him. In other words, to take away his financial power. The second one was Wagner. They've actually assimilated a lot of the Wagner fighters into the, into the Ministry of Defence. Some of them have been sent out to Africa, not all of them working for Wagner because the Russian MOD has started to set up its own internal mercenary um, organisation uh, and the remainder was sort of sent off to Belarus. So gradually it had taken a 50,000 strong outfit down to significantly smaller numbers. Mercenaries only exist by being paid. So unless they're under contract, they're not going to be making money. And effectively, that's what Putin has very effectively done until that time, two days ago, when we saw that image of um, Yevgeny Prigozhin in Africa touting for business. And he looked a somewhat forlorn character. He wasn't surrounded by his fellows. So I think there will always be some loyalists who are uh, angry at this. But to be honest, that feels like the embers of a fire rather than actually a blazing threat to Putin. A fair point to make, but but surely the other thing to say about you know Yevgeny Pogosian, given what we saw in Africa, and indeed you look back through the flight records, this was not a man who was clearly in fear for his life, was he? Why on earth would he ever march on Moscow? He must have known that would have ended badly. But there is a degree of arrogance. Sorry, but it was always going to end one way, surely. Well, you say he, that. He goes, he goes to the front door of the Kremlin, or he intends to go to the front door of the Kremlin, mm -hmm. and delivers a metaphorical two fingers to the Russian premier. I agree. And, and the way it ended, we could, it's easy to say that. But when you watch how it started, he was very angry with the Russian MOD. He was wrong, angry with General Grasimov, angry with Sergei Shogu, the defence secretary, 
angry that the Russians were not being served well by their military. When he walked into the military headquarters, not a shot was fired, and by all accounts, he was welcomed. When he went into the city nearby, there was um, applause, everyone was out there cheering. He must have felt he was on the front of a groundswell of popular opinion. Now, whatever changed on its way to Moscow, we can say now how ridiculous that sounds, because, of course, you can imagine there's a fortress in Moscow. President Putin is not going to allow Yevgeny Prigozhin to make progress. 30 of uh, Prigozhin's people were killed in a whole lot of gunfire. Six aircraft were shot down above of the Russian Air Force by Prigozhin's men. And and sure enough, the rest is history. We don't know why it stopped. But I think from that moment on, I bet a lot of his um, supporters will have been going, why did you stop? Because actually, the moment you stopped, you signed your own death warrant. Sean, for now, thanks very much indeed. And as Sean was saying, clearly this is a moving story. There will be more to come uh, from the Sky News Daily and indeed on the Sky News app and on the channel itself. Uh, But for now, we'll see you a little later on.